So we might as well start. So this is David's uh, proposal. And uh, make your presentation, and we'll have some questions from the audience, and then we'll have a private meeting with this back. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, the quick gist of this talk is going to be learning mobile manipulation. How can we interact with objects from afar using a mobile robot with a mobile manipulator? And I want to first off by say, start by saying mobile manipulation. Mobile manipulation is a hard problem. It is not solved yet. Many of the previous works rely on heuristic or rule-based strategies, not taking into account deep learning approaches that have come out recently, especially in terms of navigation and uh, for object recognition handling novel objects. Uh, we can use new advances in simulators to generate large amounts of data to train these neural networks where we weren't able before. And through this large amount of real world data captured in simulation, we can enable robustness in these deep learning algorithms for mobile manipulation. So first off, I want to start off by talking about where are we at right now, who are the major players, and what are they using? So one recent work in 2017 was looking at how can we do next best view of object recognition using a mobile manipulator um, by capturing an initial view of an object, getting an object candidate, and then based on its initial assumption of what the object is, where the next best view that would almost certainly be able to help the agent figure out what that object is. Um, and it's using a probability model in a cylinder but it's not taking into account that these mobile robots can actually get multiple views by raising or lowering the camera. Uh, and additionally, uh, it does not handle novel objects. It's really just looking at what have I seen before, what do I have 3D models for? And also, additionally, it's not taking into account semantic information um, or novel approaches in navigation. Another work uh, that came out last year was doing autonomous strawberry picking. And they have this, this map of the strawberry field, which they use G-mapping to acquire. Strawberry fields? Yeah. Forever. And uh, they have a simple arm controller with a gripper uh, that is just doing um, image thresholding to find all of the red targets in a particular image to do the picking action. So it was a very nice end-to-end -end approach for doing strawberry picking. Um, but it doesn't use any deep learning approaches. All of these are the heuristic approaches. It's assuming that these strawberry fields do not change over time, uh, that there are no obstacles in the way. Uh, it does not consider novel objects. It's really just considering strawberries. It's not, it's not designed to handle literally anything else. And uh, there's, the only semantic information is given is in the problem definition, which is picking strawberries. Additionally, there was another work uh, that recently came out in 2019 where they used a fetch robot to do semantic recognition of objects and use a search-based belief graph network uh, to figure out object relationships between each other to find an object in an environment. So it was mostly a search-based strategy. Uh, but it's only using um, meshes that it has in its database. It's only handling objects that it's aware of beforehand. Um, and for doing the navigation, it's still using that SLAM approach from before. So it's, there's no advancement here. It really is just I have a map, and I'm going to search it until I find the object. And then once I understand how the object is related to its environment, pick it. Um, so some, some data sets that researchers might consider in these previous works uh, might be the Matterport 3D data set, which is a series of 3D scanned homes in the real world uh, with 40 object categories, all real data, consisting of over 190,000 RGBD images. And they are all uh, usable in a variety of different simulators that I will talk about in a second. The SunCG uh, data set, which is a series of 45,000 synthetic homes with 84 different object categories and several hundred thousands of rooms. The only downside, of course, to this network is it's synthetic. So it's difficult to get that sim to real mapping when you're using synthetic data. And then additionally, there's the Stanford 2D 3DS data set, which is six different buildings in Stanford, very large environments, scanned, semantically labeled using 13 object categories. And it's very good for determining how robust your algorithm is for navigating through an environment. 
some simulators that you might want to use these particular navigation uh, data sets in uh, might be the Gibson simulator, which came out in 2018. Uh, it's built on top of PyBullet, so it's open source. It's support, it has built-in support for Matterport 3D and the Stanford 2D 3DS data set, and it captures a 512 by 512 RGBD image with those semantic labels as well. Conveniently, it also has a photorealistic renderer, so even though you might capture additional data in simulation, it transfers very well into the real world because the images end up looking a lot like they would if you had actually taken that picture there. The Mino simulator, which came out in 2017, is built for Matterport 3D and SunCG data specifically, can handle arbitrary resolution rendering. It's basically just a point <laughs> renderer in space, but it's built on JavaScript and as a result is very slow and difficult to optimize and capture large amounts of data. And the Habitat Simulator, which came out last year from Facebook, uh, is built for Matterport 3D and SunCG as well. It captures at 10,000 frames per second. It's built and optimized to capture images very quickly, but doesn't load URDFs and doesn't allow for any physics simulation. So if you were actually wanting to do mobile manipulation tasks and simulation, this would be only for rendering the navigation piece and not the actual pick and place. And because we have these high level APIs, we can enable new approaches that we weren't able to before. And so a uh, particular video of a robotic agent moving through an environment, I believe this is the Stanford uh, offices, this uh, Husky robot is going to move through the environment, this RGB, frame stream is actually the photorealistic rendering that looks pretty good. I like it. Uh, the semantic labels and depth information are coming out live as well, and it also gives you surface normal. So lots of different ways to input data that you might not have access to in the real world, but you can train models to reproduce these results in the real world just using RGB and depth. Additionally, Gibson has this photorealistic rendering module, and so you can see that there's this big hole in the image coming out of Gibson, and they use a style transfer uh, network trained specifically to recreate the image based on an input image captured in simulation. And because of this, uh, we can have some guarantees about the data. I think I've said that enough, so I won't, I won't beat you guys too much with it. So the overview of my approach is going to be to perform visual semantic navigation to a particular object of interest. Once we're at that object, we do shape understanding to predict the geometry of the object. Because we're using a mobile robot, we can actually do next best view shape refinement planning. Sorry. And capture a second view to enhance the completion of the object, and then use grass planning to pick the object from the table. So I'll first discuss how I approached visual semantic navigation. And so the key ideas here is that we're only using RGBDS input alone. So there's no position or orientation or odometry provided. It's just the previous five images that the agent has seen. The panoramic target, we're using a eight image panoramic goal so as to have a context uh, free position goal. It was better for collecting data and simulation. Um, because I didn't have to worry about the image facing a wall, for example. Uh, I have this uh, photorealistic render that comes for free by using Gibson, and I can collect lots and lots of data because it's all in simulation. And we're using imitation learning built on trajectories calculated using Dijkstra's algorithm through these environments. And so these paths are automatically collision free due to the way that these paths are built using the ROS package move base. And so this is an example trajectory that uh, the agent was trained on to navigate through this environment. And I can show you in a, in a second how this agent actually behaved after it learned based on these trajectories. So these trajectories are discretized into a series of forward, left, and right commands based on the initial um, points in space and orientations that the robot was supposed to follow. And so we have several thousand trajectories for each of these environments. So for house two and house one, which are the least complex, we have 7,000 each. 5,000 for a medium complexity house 17 as it gets bigger. And then for the Stanford 2D 3DS data set, we have these two with 3,000 trajectories each. Uh, it's just purely a, a data limitation problem just because these environments are so large. 
And so this, this algorithm can be applied to multiple different robotic agents. We're using the fetch robot in simulation, but this could very easily be translated onto a drone with mobile arms that allows it to grasp an object of interest. Because we don't have that odometry, that's, that's why I'm pointing out the drone. Uh, so the, the actual methodology here is we have the panoramic goal, history buffer, four previous images and current view. We train an autoencoder to reproduce those images. So this is the reproduced image right here. We create a dense embedding here that we use as input into a um, policy. This is the embedding here. First, we take the panoramic goal and current view and pass it through a goal checker and evaluate, are we actually done yet? That's how we get around the issue of odometry and a point goal. We're just using images to determine, are we done? We have a, a certain value of certainty that we're done. In this case, we're not done yet. This is the network architecture that we're using for that. And then once, once we get the value out of the goal checker, we'll determine, is it equal to one? If so, we spin in a circle and affirm, on average, we're performing better than 90%. We're very certain we're done, and we say we're done. Otherwise, we go to the policy, and we get the next action that we want to execute. So that will take uh, the eight panoramic goal images and the history buffer, as well as the current view, to output one of three commands, forward, left, or right. We get a certain probability distribution for each of the commands. In this case, we want to execute a forward command. That makes an update on the environment, uh, shown here. And then that gets fed back into the input of the autoencoder, and we get a control loop that looks something like this, where the agent successfully navigates to the goal of interest, and then once it gets there, spins to reach consensus. And additionally, something I'm proposing to add on to this is to add semantic labels as output of the autoencoder so that dense representation has additional semantic information. And I have some preliminary results that show how that impacts uh, the success rate of this original RGBD alone method. And so this is an example trajectory trained in the Area 1 environment. So you can see that the agent starts over here, successfully finds its way all the way to the goal location here, and does that circular spin in place to determine, yes, I am actually done. Uh, this trajectory was not observed during training. but it looks too good to be true. So here's another example where uh, I think the, the images are not synchronized. But this agent made an assumption to go down this hallway, decided it's no longer the correct way to go, turned around, and successfully got there. And we notice this emergent recovery behavior showing up when we train it to be more robust to these various situations where it might be going the wrong way or started in the incorrect orientation to leave a particular room. Um, of course, we need to benchmark this. We need to compare this against state of the art. So our tab map is a RGBD stereo and LIDAR graph-based SLAM algorithm that's using images to slowly build up a map. And it uses an incremental appearance-based loop closure detector to basically affirm, OK, yes, this is the update I need to make to the map. Uh, it allows for this localization when doing graph lookups. And uh, it does not allow for RGBD-based goals and does not take advantage of semantic information, and has no manipulation. It is purely using point goals to determine, am I done yet? An additional work, AI2Thor, uh, was using RL to train an agent. It took in RGB images for the current view and the goal location, and used ResNet to compress the state embedding down to a latent space vector that it used to drive a policy that gave forward, left, or right commands. And it trained it on 26 different rooms an agent per each of those rooms, but didn't take advantage of depth information, didn't take care of uh, semantic information, and also did not do the manipulation, and relied on an idealized GPS, which isn't always necessarily great when you're doing real-world experiments. Uh, it, it used the GPS to determine, am I done? It, it, the policy was the only thing that was sort of open loop. Additionally, uh, some recent work that I haven't benchmarked against yet, but I'm looking to, is this decentralized distributed PPO algorithm that came out in 2019 that uses an RL policy uh, distributed across 64 different GPUs trained simultaneously. They use 2.5 billion images to train this model, just an absolutely absurd amount of information. And they use the Habitat simulator. 
Um, but they relied on GPS and compass as input into the policy to handle unseen environments and they don't consider manipulation tasks. My method, on the other hand, only used 450,000 images per environment. So substantially more information uh, to learn functionally the same thing for a particular environment. And the experimental setup is these five different environments, 400 holdout trajectories not observed during training, we tested ours with GPS, without GPS for the goal checking, the SLAM algorithm, our tab map that I described before, and the Siamese actor critic network. And whenever a collision occurred during training, during um, experimental execution, it died. And so here are the examples of uh, our agent performing versus the Siamese actor critic and SLAM algorithms. As, as you can see, our successfully gets there. The Siamese actor critic fails to localize itself and SLAM does not uh, perform very well uh, given that it does not have the map at runtime. Uh, additionally, in the house one environment, ours performs very well, gets to the goal location. House 17, again, ours is able to navigate through the whole environment. Uh, area two gets a little bit more complicated as it goes down an entire corridor, a much bigger environment. And then finally, uh, we navigate from this room here all the way to this goal location there. And so some metrics that we use to evaluate the quality of the performance between the different agents is the success weighted by path length metric. And it has a, a binary indicator of success, the shortest path distance from the agent's starting point, and the observed distance. And basically, we're just trying to normalize the um, we're, we're not trying to overly punish these agents uh, for bad trajectories. We kind of want to see how do they perform given the length of the, the path, not just you know, how many correct actions did it take. Additionally, we have this more intuitive observed over optimal, which is just literally taking the observed path length over the optimal path length divided by the number of successful trials. And really, we're just trying to figure out, okay, if it was successful, how well does it perform on average? Just Intuitively, it made more sense. And so uh, these agents uh, were compared in different environments. So starting over here on the left, this is the house two, simplest environment. Green is ours with a GPS in the goal checking. And blue was ours with no GPS, uh, so using the learned goal checker. And then we have the Siamese actor critic and SLAM methods. And as you can see, ours has a much higher success rate, both in the GPS and no GPS case. As the environment complexity increases, so does the success rate decrease, especially for our comparison methods, substantially goes down as uh, the complexity increases. And so just looking at it overall, we can see that even in the most complex environment, ours is still greatly outperforming the benchmarks. The success weighted by path length metric is just showing here that we're getting about 75% of the optimal trajectory is how to read this, where higher is better here. Um, even in the case that we have deprived the agent of GPS, we're still getting relatively close performance to the optimal trajectory. And then the average of the observed over optimal SLAM is performing very poorly because it often timed out, um, but ours was performing significantly. Uh, better and closer to the optimal. Additionally, I mentioned that I had some initial results for semantics, so I've added semantic information on the autoencoder for some of those holdout trajectories, and I found that the success rate substantially improved across the board. Um, adding that semantic information, I guess, allowed the agent to better localize during uh, execution and therefore more successfully navigate to the goal location, and this is without GPS in both of these cases. All right, so that's, that's the navigation piece. That's, that's what we do to get to the object of interest. But now what do we do once we're there? We need to perform some kind of shape completion, shape understanding. So Jake Varley came up with this method back in, in 2017, where he took an image of an object, turned it into a point cloud representation, voxelized that point cloud rec representation, passed it through a neural network, learned to complete the, the shape of the object, turned that into a mesh, and then used Graspit to do grasp planning on that completed mesh. And I'm proposing some changes to this pipeline to 
enhance it and make it more robust, especially given that we have this mobile manipulator. So this was the initial architecture that he used, CNN architecture, simple feed forward network. I'm proposing a change of using a reconstructive GAN network proposed by Yang et al. And he's getting 64 cubed to 256 cubed. He did not consider grasping in his particular paper. He was specifically looking at just general object reconstruction. But I'm going to train his network using this uh, focus on graspable objects. And he's additionally having this discriminator architecture that's taking the fake reconstruction, the real reconstruction, and determining how likely is that reconstruction accurate. Additionally, I am proposing a novel way to train this particular network called NoGAN. Basically, it is training the generator individually by itself initially. And then once it gets a series of samples from the generator, I train the discriminator on those samples separately. And then I combine the two training together there are some preliminary results in a different work that were showing substantial improvement on the accuracy of the output of the, of the GAN as opposed to simply training them together in tandem from the get-go. Some objects that I'm considering using for this particular uh, problem is the YCB object data set, which we have uh, the real-world objects in the lab, and the GRASS data set, which is 590 unique synthetic meshes of objects that you would want to pick up. Additionally, I might, you know, use ShapeNet or various other networks, but at least for a benchmark, this was convenient. Uh, as far as the data set is concerned, I'm going to have triplets of data where I have this initial view of the object captured. Uh, I'm going to use a next best view algorithm I'm going to describe in a second to determine an optimal secondary view of the object. And Additionally, have the ground truth mesh voxelized, and that will be the input to train this particular network. Is uh, Initially, a network will be trained on the single view reconstruction, and then the two views concatenate it together, and then reconstruction. And so one of the nice parts of Jake's network architecture, and additionally this Yang architecture, is that each of the voxels has a certain certainty that it is occupied between 0 and 1. And we can use that certainty to determine how likely um, you know, this region is to be occupied or not, or if it's completely uncertain. And so I'm, I'm proposing we use this, this uncertainty principle uh, to get the ne optimal next best view to do better shape completion. Uh, but before we, we do that, quickly let's talk about how did we do this before. So Connolly in 1985 proposed this sphere uh, sphere constraint where the camera could be placed at any one of these spherical locations and he's counting the number of voxels that will be illuminated by placing the camera there and it was a very nice method in that at the time computation was very expensive and it was very easy to just count up the number of voxels that will be illuminated by pointing a camera uh, at a particular location and it was a very optimal algorithm using this wall area by calculating the number of surfaces that are um, next to unobserved and observed voxels. Uh, but there's no voxel certainty here. There's no concept of, yes, I'm absolutely sure or not sure that this region is, is filled or not. And additionally, we're limited to this sphere. And we're not really exploring any other positions outside of this. Additionally, we have a uh, work by PETO which is taking an initial image of an object and calculating the volume of the, of the space that's occluded. And we're trying to optimize for a second view that is going to reduce this uh, occluded volume by as much as possible. And so he devised an algorithm that will search along this circle to find the next best view. Um, but again, it doesn't consider certainty that uh, that particular region is actually filled or not where you might be able to intuit, OK, there might, might be a hole here. And uh, additionally, we're not using that 3D information that we have with these mobile manipulators to get all their views. RoboScan was a work that came out in 2004 that was just scanning along a surface for very large objects, like scanning a, a mummy or, or something. And they had a novel methodology of projecting rays into space to find any holes during the scanning process. 
to basically make sure that I, I'm not missing any part of the mesh. I need to get a secondary view here to make sure that the rendering and, and mesh are airtight. Um, but it doesn't consider certainty. There's no grasping here. There's no manipulation. And it's really just for the scanning. This, this, is, not a, this is not a general purpose algorithm. It's really just to have a, a very good scanning algorithm using a heuristic. And so the pipeline I'm proposing is we capture this initial view after doing navigation. We get the initial completion. We compute the uncertainty using that initial completion. We capture a secondary view based on the uncertainty that we calculated. We complete using those two views and then grasp the object. And so the object will be chosen uh, by picking the object closest to the camera. There's a variety of different methods, but this seems like the simplest way is if uh, a user is pointing a camera at a particular object, pick the object closest to the first image. Uh, and use the segmentation to pull out the point cloud. So take this rubber duck, Ikra loves rubber ducks, and we get a point cloud for this particular rubber duck, and then we complete the mesh here. We, we actually find all of the certainty that these voxels are filled using the shape completion algorithm. And so this algorithm seems to have decided these voxels are very uncertain, where 0.5 means I'm, I'm just a 50-50, it could be filled, it could not be. And one being it's definitely filled because I observed stuff there. And so because we have this voxel uncertainty, we, we could theoretically just threshold at 50%, which is what the previous work did, and, and say, OK, it's probably filled. But we could utilize this information to find this region of uncertainty and project a ray to the centroid of the voxel grid through the centroid of the region of uncertainty to capture a secondary view using the mobile robot that we have. And using that secondary view, get a better completion of the object, recognizing that actually this voxel was not filled, and only this one was. And so we're going to have these two networks, as I mentioned, one that goes uh, from 64 cubed to 256 cubed, one trained on the single view, and one trained on both views. Uh, and we need to train both models because if we just simply concatenate the second view on top of the initial completion, we could have holes in the completed mesh, which might make grasping less accurate as a result. So some testing to validate whether or not this algorithm is working is we have the Jacquard metric, which is just testing to see overlapping voxels. It's taking a union of those voxels. And then additionally, we have the Hausdorff metric, which is comparing the distance between the surfaces of the, the meshes the ground truth mesh and the uh, completed mesh. And so we will uh, evaluate both of them using those two metrics. Uh, we're going to use a local plan uh, to find uh, a trajectory to get to that next best view, uh, just simply from its current view, how do we navigate there. And uh, the completion will also be evaluated for grasp quality, so using the, the projected grasp pose versus the uh, actual grasp pose. Uh, additionally, we will be comparing, OK, if we did that second view concatenation, how well does the, the mesh line up versus doing a second and initial view completion? And grasp it is just simply get, giving us those projected join angles given the completion, and then we execute in simulation, and then ultimately in the real world, uh, based on how accurate that was, using novel hands like the, uh, I'm sorry, three-fingered hands, not novel, uh, like the Barrett. So in some justification for, for this methodology is uh, some previous work I've done used depth and tactile information to complete a mesh. Uh, and I, I used my next best view algorithm to find the, the centroid of that, and I did a next best touch. I illuminated that voxel in simulation to figure out how much more accurate would that mesh have been given that new information. And I trained a model to recognize that. And so the Jacquard quality improved over depth and tactile alone, where this was using randomized tactile just by shooting rays at the occluded side of the object. And the uh, Hausdorff was significantly closer where lower is better. And the join error was also lower because the mesh was closer to the actual mesh that it was supposed to be, just because we have that most uncertain region illuminated rather than using randomized tactile. And this was using two touches. So adding actual depth information will be substantially richer than just using a single touch. 
And additionally, uh, if I have time, I will investigate this next best view versus doing next best touch, where we have uh, tactile information coming in from the occluded side using that next best view algorithm. Uh, I get this uh, point, concatenated point cloud representation where blue is tactile and red is depth. I voxelize it and I use shape completion to get an accurate mesh. And it will be a benchmark versus the uh, next best view. So for experimental testing, how am I going to validate this entire process? Uh, well, I'm going to test visual semantic navigation in the Matterport 3D and Stanford 2D 3DS data sets. Um, objects from those, the YCB and GRASP database will be placed in simulation. The robot will navigate to those objects of interest. We'll do grasping and simulation on those objects uh, and determine uh, all of the quality metrics I've described previously and do a lift and see if it was successful. Uh, and then I will capture an environment, Sepsir most likely, and I will evaluate in simulation whether or not my methodology still works by placing objects in simulation in the real world captured Sepsir. And I will test its ability to navigate to the goal region. I will recreate this simulated experiment in the real world once, that, once the metrics look like it's reliable enough where I will have it navigate, say, to this room and pick up something on the table. And once I'm able to grasp a real world object, I will consider uh, my proposal uh, complete. Uh, so my contributions here are uh, this visual semantic navigation pipeline. So we're using a novel pipeline to navigate to unseen targets using RGBDS. Uh, we do not need GPS compass map or relative position of the goals at runtime. We simply need this image. Uh, we're us utilizing a novel panoramic goal uh, as opposed to a single view. Uh, we're using semantic information inputted at training time, uh, whereas other methods are not. And we have this framework to efficiently generate optimal um, expert trajectories for the agent to navigate through the environment without collisions. And we also have this novel methodology for discretizing a continuous set of uh, positions and orientations of the agent in simulation into forward, left, or right commands. Additionally, we have the shape understanding, where we have a framework for integrating uh, visual sensory data uh, to reason about the object geometry, uh, this novel next best view planning algorithm using the voxel uncertainty, this open source data set for training shape understanding will have the single view, second view, and ground truth meshes available uh, for usage. Uh, we'll have real and simulated grasping experiments evaluating this particular method, increasing the resolution to 256 cubed, uh, utilizing point cloud fusion uh, to increase the resolution of the original captured view, uh, where we're concatenating those two views together using point cloud fusion, and uh, we're open sourcing the data set for point cloud data for that next best view training. And then my timeline, as uh, shown here, is I've done some of the work already for visual shape understanding, and I've done the visual navigation piece. The next steps are to do the next best view planning this spring, shape understanding refinement as well this spring, and then begin writing my thesis and defending early next year. And that is it. Thank you. We're doing that very concisely, so right up the valley. So I think what we'd like to do now is have some questions from the audience, if there are any. I have a um, question. Uh, you had that one slide on the uh, single view versus your second view, and you were saying you were just doing two models. Yeah, let me pull that up. I didn't quite catch. I didn't fully understand. Yeah, I can. I can better explain. What's going on there? Just trying to find the slide. I might add we have plenty of food for those. Yes, those please, countries. please eat. Uh, let me just, I'll draw a, a quick picture of, of what I mean. So basically, if we have, let's say, a box, and we capture a view of the box from, from this, and all we get is a point cloud consisting of this side. We don't see any of the other sides might treat this as maybe a cell phone or something that's you know, just a little bit inflated from the initial view. Uh, and let's say the highest region of uncertainty is here because maybe there's a hypothesis that 
This could have also been a banana, which is also in the database. So we go and capture a secondary view here, and we get points all along here that gives us a better idea that, you know what, maybe this was a box all along. If I had just done the initial completion and then concatenated this view, I would get this weird L shape, which I'm not going to be able to accurately plan grasps on, because it might try to grab this region when it doesn't realize that, OK, I can't actually put my hand there in that configuration. And so instead, we have a full secondary completion based on these two captured views. Where does the second network come into play? After we get this initial completion, mm -hmm. uh, we capture the second view and pass in all of these points into the second network. It has to be trained on the two data because if, if we use the network that was trained on single views, it's not going to handle situations where it has more data than that. And, but then the question of just using the second network isn't good enough because... Then it would have only been seeing two... It, the second network has to come from the first network because I need the data for the voxel certainty. Like the method doesn't work unless I get the initial completion. At least the way I've described it. It, it. I need that initial hypothesis to get the second view and then once I have that second view then do the second completion. And then theoretically you could keep chaining it um, where maybe you just show most of the box to some future network and then just kind of fill in those holes um, but at, at the very least, I'm proposing a two-network solution. Does that make more sense? Could, it, could you do like a single network where you just use the same, you use the first network right, to get the region of uncertainty, plan your next best view, yep. and you're using the same network, right? Um, and then you um, maybe now can get in the space. I could definitely use one well, singular that's, network. That's, that's basically something we can benchmark. Yeah. And that may be simple enough to do, yeah. So I could train it on both of the data, yes. Um, that's just something. It, it's kind of recursive in that regard, though, because I'll be training it based on data that it itself generated, and it's a little bizarre, but I could do it. Um, again, we, can, uh, we have a private session afterwards, so if anyone wants a public question now, we can do that. We guys have very little interest in this work, seemingly. What sort of semantic <laughs> data are you adding? Uh, the per pixel labeling of, of the environments. And where, so, where are these labels coming from? Uh, they're, they're manual. So in the case of SunCG, it was, it was synthetically just annotated because of how it was designed. But Matterport 3D and Stanford are both manually annotated. You can ask Sharan, actually, because she did a lot of the annotation. Herself. Okay, so since Matea has a constraint, oh, sorry, you have a question? Oh, just a quick one. Um, so right now you are limited to two views, right? Yeah. Or uh, that's just like, um, have you, do you know, like, why it stopped there? Like, why not um, go for other views? It's, it, it can definitely keep, you could keep chaining views. It's just simply a singular enhancement so that you're not waiting 800 years to eventually actually just pick up the object. Right. I'm trying to say, you know, two views is enough. I, th I could definitely benchmark, okay, three, four, five views later, I have way higher accuracy or the accuracy doesn't improve at all. And that's definitely something I will evaluate uh, to figure out the quality. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of choosing the next view, yeah. um, what do you say to the easy heuristic of going all the way in the opposite direction? Um, I, it's, it, it's about optimizing you know, that navigation piece. I see. So, so you're thinking of it in terms of placing some constraints on how far the views should be to each other. Like, are there some constraints on how far the views should be? When I was doing the next best touch testing, I was, I was basically illuminating a 4x4x4 four by four by four cube of voxels anytime I would touch any of them and basically say that's seen. So when I get that next best view and I concatenate the views, Certainly, there's only so many additional voxels that are going to be illuminated by a, a third or fourth view. So I'll certainly constrain it after that. But yes, a 180 view is theoretically the best. But I'm trying to sort of optimize here where, OK, maybe the, the network is learning a representation that that 
secondary view might be better than a direct 180 view. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so maybe you can have a conversation around, say, um, maybe um, with just nine, with just nine degrees, you can have maximal performance. This is going all the way. Because you may have a constraint too. There may be a table that prevents you from doing that. Yeah. So there, there are other constraints in the system. It, it's a, it's a good thought. Uh, I, that would be an interesting benchmark to compare against. Okay. No. Oh, yes. Uh, so before we uh, before we start to grasp the object, mm -hmm. uh, so we are using the semantic in information to create the first voxel grid, right? But the semantic information itself might have uh, errors, and to I mean, so the boundaries associated with with this particular object might be uncertain in the first place. So yes, how how can we handle that? Uh, you know, in this approach. And so I. I haven't really thought about this too much recently, but when we were originally looking at it, uh, we were going to use a super voxel approach where we find all of the most likely related voxels and do a, a maximal um, labeling of each of those voxels using you know, partial, partially labeled information so as to smooth over the view. But I, I haven't exactly figured out how I'm going to handle the the noise that comes from the scanner. I want to first have a method that I can complain about first, you know. Okay, I think the past constraint. So let's um, end there for David and And we'll meet with you right now. Great.